Uh, we're part of division and economic risk analysis. So we're not part of Corfin. We're not part of enforcement. We mainly have economists who work on rulemaking, uh, specifically on cost benefit analysis. If those rules have structured data component, that's where our office comes in. And our attorneys actually draft part of that role. We also work on uh, analytic applications and publish data sets. But I'll go into a little bit more of that later. And let me start with the standard disclaimer with any SEC presentations. The present session today is provided in my official capacity as the commission's assistant director of the Office of Disclosure and does not reflect the views of the commission, commissioners, or, or other members of the staff. And before I begin my presentation, I do want to thank you for your research efforts. Without the academics looking at XBL data or any other topics, we won't be where we are. And we greatly appreciate your interest, but also taking the time. Okay. Oops. Here are some of the topics I want to discuss with you today. A lot of this you, you may have know already. Um, what is structured data? How do we use it? Who uses it? The last question is something we get questions all the time, not from academics like you, because you yourselves use them, but other stakeholders, whether it be filers, investors, or even SEC staff ask who uses expert data? Why do we have it? So I'd like to just lightly cover that go through inline XPRL, uh, some of the tools that we now have, and the Financial Data Transparency Act. Uh, that was a pretty important act that requires the commission and other financial regulatory agencies to uh, take more actions on data quality. So I wanna cover that as well. And also discuss data quality, other observations we have and issue to filers and tagging vendors, and end with uh, our financial data sets. All right, so who uses structured data? Let's start with the top, academics like yourselves. We have a public facing inbox, structured data at scc.gov, where any users can send us questions about XBRL data, including the filers and tagging vendors. Questions about how do I tag this? What, when is the taxonomy gonna be available for this new uh, disclosure or new role? We also get a lot of questions from academics on their use of XBRL data and what they can find using structured data for their research papers. FASB. So you, you might remember a couple of years ago, FASB came out with two significant accounting standard updates, lease accounting and revenue standards. They use structured data to assess what the effect of those new standards will be using structured data. Financial analyst. Uh, FASB has an annual webinar in April every year, and they discuss taxonomy updates and um, the structured data updates and part of that, we we also discuss what's new with SEC, either Edgar updates or how we're using the data. They also invite keynote speakers in the industry. For example, a couple of years ago, they had a representative from JP Morgan who discussed using the XBRL data for their investment analysis. We had another person from another firm who talked about using the XBRL data for Jobs uh, Cuts Act. In addition to these folks, we also have FDIC, uh, Federal Reserve, Bank of England, who are using the structured data. Let's do a quick history of how structured data program at the SEC came about. In 2005, we had a volunteer program allowing filers to give us XBRL data if they want to. Uh, then 2009, we adopted interactive data roles requiring operating companies and then later mutual fund companies to give us XBRL data with a three-year uh, phase in. So meaning the biggest filers, the large filers go first, non-accelerated, small reporting companies and the four private issuers go uh, last. IFRS taxonomy was adopted in 2017. That was a big year. So we've always had gap taxonomy uh, since 2010. We didn't have IFRS taxonomy. We SEC adopted that in 2017. Then 2018 was a, another big year, inline XBRL. And in case somebody was joking about how to spell XBRL, um, in case you're not aware of what the stands for, it's extensible, uh, extensible business reporting language. You can think of it as it's a language for the machines to read and process the data. And in 2018, we also had the same three-year implementation. Large filers going first, smaller reporting companies, and foreign private issuers going uh, later. And the big difference between the traditional XBRL and the inline XBRL is that it's it combines the human readable, right? It has the presentation of a human filing the UCHTML, 
But when you hover over data that's tagged, you see the metadata, codifications, what references this data related to, what balances, is it debit or credit? So it makes it very easier for filers and other users to use the data, but also spot some data quality errors that I'll go over later. Uh, in 2019, we started having a lot of structured uh, rules with structured data requirement. Um, and if anyone's kind of following what we've been doing, we've had over 15 rules in the past couple of years with uh, adopted releases that has structured data requirement. So I briefly spoke about Financial Data Transparency Act. This was signed into law in December of last year, and it requires SEC and other financial regulatory agencies to act on data. For example, we have to adopt data standards for reports filed under the 1933 Act, 1934 Act, and 1940 Act. We also have to adopt a legal ident uh, identifier legal entity identifier that enables openness and machine readability of public data. We have to establish a data quality program. And lastly, we have to report to Congress every six months from uh, the enactment of the law to in the next seven years on how the commission staff use the data, how the public staff use data. We have our work cut out for us. The first report was issued in June of this year. So what did the report talk about? Um, it's a pretty short report. I encourage you taking a look if you haven't done so yet. But the points that were interesting to most people was how does commission staff use it? So let's start with a few examples here. Corporation finance, in case you are not aware, those are the folks who have uh, direct relationships with the filers. They issue common letters and they oversee operating companies. So they review periodic filings like 10K, 10Q, they also review registering statements. Those folks have used structured data to identify issuers that are subject to certain disclosure requirements, or they may be having some uh, tr uh, trading prohibitions, for example, holding foreign companies accountable act. If you remember that act required filers to give us structured data about their auditors, for example, what is the auditor's name? Where was the auditor located? And until recently, PCOB could not inspect audit firms in China. So there, there's some risk about filers having auditors in China. And Corfin used that data to monitor that. Both Corfin and our division staff use structured data that appear on cover pages of certain periodic filings to count, sort, and analyze to see which filers are trading on what exchange which filers are well-seasoned uh, filers. Investment management staff. So that is the group that oversees investment advisors and investment companies. And they have used structured data to detect errors, inconsistencies within filings and identify funds with particular characteristics or certain holdings or exposures. They do a really good job of noting data quality when they're doing their disclosure review, and they often contact the filer directly. Office of the Chief Accountants. That group works on accounting standard settings. They also oversee PCOB, and they work on accounting consultation. They have used output from the analytical tools that we have to conduct research accounting consultations, information gathering, relevant to accounting standard setting projects, and preparation of re responses to specific data requests as part of their accounting consultation. So talked about inline XPRL. You have the HTML filing that a lot of people are used to reading, but it actually combines XPRL data. When you hover over tag data, you see the embedded data within that. Here's an example of inline filing. So the one of the easy things to kind of, easiest things that inline in XPL that enables you to do is you can quickly go through the data points, especially the ones that are tagged. So if you hover over cash and cash group from here, you see the accounting standard codifications. When you select a tag, it comes with the accounting codification, right? The taxonomy team work with standards team to make sure all the tags are partner with a codification. So when I was in, um, audit firm, 
I had a 400 page audit checklist that I had to go through. And then if it was a special industry, I had to go through another checklist. If I had this function, it would have been very easy to see which tags, which data is related to a specific codification or which ones are missing, right? Which ones are not there and why don't they have it? If they have cash, why didn't they tag it or why didn't they talk about this particular disclosure even though they have cash? Inline Expert also has filters. So you can sort the data by period, by scaling, by balance. One of the th issues that we see often is a public float error or scaling error in, in some of the rest of the filings. We've seen filers who put extra three zeros in public float. So it's a non accelerated filer that has trillion in public float, clearly wrong. Or someone has uh, right amount of zeros in HTML, but not XBRL. So when data users like yourselves are trying to get the data, they weren't able to see it because the amount wasn't showing up. One of the tools we have is called Financial Statement Core Viewer. It's, it allows uh, filers to staff to search and review filings across all facts. There are potential things we can do searching uh, using certain criteria such as CIK, industry, filer size, searching by fact, a specific disclosure type or specific taxonomy element, the tag, searching by text, doing a keyword search in a narrative disclosure, and compare footnotes. Because the footnotes are structured, we're able to do a red line. This allows us to quickly look at how did the footnote change over time? Why did it change? Or did they completely skip a footnote? Why would that be? Is it no longer material? Or did they just forget? We can save all these searches and share with others at the commission who may be doing the same search. Some example text search using FSQB, researching filings that mention ESG. Then dissecting that result further into where does ESG most mentioned in a filing? Again, where we can save all these results and share with our colleagues. Another tool is called Filer Profile. You can think of this as a kind of a dashboard. So before you go into a specific filer or filing, this will give you a summary of what's going on with the filer. For example, it gives you some key data points on certain financial information or audit information. It highlights potentially high risk area and allows you to dive in further if you click on that data point and it'll take you to a source document. It does enable staff to quickly identify specific areas before they begin a further review. In addition to developing these tools, we also review filings for data quality issues. And we issue observations or guidance on our website. So the filers and the tagging vendors are aware of what we're looking at and they can fix it. I talked about scaling errors. We've also seen filers using incorrect tag. For example, using a liability tag for revenue disclosure. You don't need to be a CPA to know that's wrong. And when we see easy issues, easy errors like that, it makes us pause and think about what else could be wrong with this filer. If you can't even get the tag name correctly, what else could be wrong? Or is it possible that whoever is tagging it doesn't have accounting knowledge or isn't reading it? So is there, is there a deficiency in their financial reporting process? You've also, you might have also seen Division of Corporation Finance issuing common letters and data quality, such as when filers didn't even give us XPL data. That's a violation against interactive data rules. When filers didn't tag every single amount in the footnotes, our rules require that you do that. The filers do that. Uh, when filers have issues on scaling, when they're missing zeros. You might also be aware of Corfin issuing a sample letter on XBRL topics in uh, September of this year. So it's a you can consider it as kind of a dear issuer letter, letting the public know, hey, we're looking at these areas, you might get a comment on these. And some of them included things like, you didn't give us XBRL. Uh, for pay versus performance data role, you did not tag these. So a lot of questions that we get uh, from the public is, what is SEC doing about data quality? You know, is, 
is SEC actually contacting the filers on these issues that you see? Because as you know, all the structured data is great, but if you don't have high quality, it's not as useful. And it really inhibits the use of the data and also impact your research. In addition to the observations and the guidance we issue, we also look at custom tag analysis. So in case you're not aware, interactive data rules do allow filers to create custom tags, but it's very specific when you can do it. It's only if your transaction or disclosure is very unique and you cannot find a standard tag. Now, we've seen filers who create tags for property plan equipment. Okay, I think we can all agree that's a very standard disclosure and both GAP and IFRS taxonomy has tag for pp &E. So why are you creating a custom tag? And when we look at custom tag rates, this is for GAP, it's pretty consistent. It's at 20%, 19%, depending on the filer size. A lot of times when we see a little bit of a intake uh, uptake is if we have a new accounting standard and new tags and filers haven't gotten used to using those tags yet. But as you can see, it's been improving. And if you go back to 2016, 2017, we were starting at 22, 23%. So it's been coming down. Now compare that to IFRS, it's much higher. Does anyone have an idea why IFRS has higher hot but if you think about the IFRS taxonomy, right? So to kind of begin, GAP taxonomy has over 20,000 tags. IFRS taxonomy has about 5,000 tags. And it makes sense that's the way it is because IFRS is covering multiple jurisdictions, different types of filers across different countries. So you would expect to see a little more custom tags on the IFRS side than the GAP side. But same with GAP, it's coming down a little bit and same with GAP as well. When you see your kind of standard uh, issued by IFRS or ISB, we do see a little bit of an uh, uptake. Oh, sorry. I'm gonna end my presentation with the uh, financial statements and those data. This is one of the most heavily downloaded sets on our website. We do have the October uh, data set on our website, it's free, free for public, anyone to use. Um, easy way to remember our website is xbrl.sec.gov.